Hello, everybody, and this is Stacy from The Advisor, and today I'm very excited because we have a very, very, very special guest. We have Leslie Davis, and she's the author of You Can't Eat Love, and she is just an amazing person, and she has such valuable information about different ways on coping with our emotions and not having to resort to food and other unhealthy ways of trying to cope with life's um, daily obstacles that give us a lot of different mo mo emotions to deal with. And she's going to tell you a lot about herself and what she does. And she's going to give you some great tools and strategies and advice. So Leslie, take it away and tell everybody a little about yourself, what you do. And I want to hear it all because I'm very excited to have you on the show. Well, Stacey, I am so excited to be here. First of all, I am in awe of everything that you do. You are an absolutely amazing person. And to think that I am here with you, oh my gosh, I am just, you know, fangirling to use one of the, uh, one of those weird words that's out there. But who am I? I am a person who a little over three years ago um, had an epiphany. And the epiphany was that as I, it occurred as I was eating a piece of pie. And as I was eating this pie, it was from a family recipe that we've been making now for about a hundred years. I, I'm not a hundred years old, so don't get too excited. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> as I was eating the pie, I was reflecting on memories and I had memories of my mother who has now been gone for about 40 years. I had memories of my father who had died not that long before memories of my grandparents, Willie Mae, and, you know, so many other family members who have gone on. And as I was enjoying this pie, I realized, I said, the love is in the memories. The love is not in the food. Right. You can't eat love. Mm -hmm. And I grabbed a pen and paper and I scribbled down what became the first three to four paragraphs of the book, You Can't Eat Love. Now, what was the giant epiphany? The giant epiphany was that what I had been doing was believing that nobody loved me. Right. And it turned out the only person who didn't love me was me. And I understood I had what I like to call a myself sized hole in my heart that I had been filling with food mm -hmm. instead of love. I had been trying to eat the love that I struggled to find. Right. And when I realized that, I started asking myself some questions. And the questions that I started asking were, what are you really feeling right now? What is really going on? And as I started listening to the answers to those questions, and I started acknowledging what I was really feeling in that moment. Right. And I'm talking about really in all capitals, bolded, italicized, and underlined, being honest with myself about what I was really feeling, no matter how socially unacceptable it might have been. Yeah. The need, the drive to go and get chips, a whole bag of Ruffles potato chips. I'm not talking about the small one either. And right. a container of onion dip, not the small one either, started losing its power. It started losing its attraction. Mm -hmm. And when, when I was tracking what I was eating, writing down what I was eating, and I would look at the list and I would see I had, you know, eaten a whole uh, sleeve of Girl Scout Thin Mints. I had eaten, you know, more than what I had planned, intended or anything else. Right. I realized, you know, something, there was something going on here. So what was it that was going on in these moments? Right. And I would write in next to where I had tracked the food. This mm -hmm. is what was going on. Right. So now you're probably asking, well, what does this have to do with anything? It has to do with what I am so passionate about. And if you would let me, you and I could have a conversation. I promise it won't be one-sided. I promise. <laughs> you and I could have a conversation that could go on for days because I know it's part of what you're passionate about. Yeah. I was talking to somebody else and I asked them this question. 
how many times have you shared with somebody what you are really feeling and your, their response to you is you shouldn't feel that way. Right. And how do you feel in that moment? And the sudden realization that I had was when we say to somebody, our honest emotion, our honest feeling, regardless of what it is, how socially acceptable or unacceptable it might be, and they respond with, you shouldn't be feeling that way. It is almost as if they are saying to me or saying to you, the pink shirt that you are wearing is really blue. Mm -hmm. Yes. It's and so how often are we taught to not feel or to not name that honest feeling. Mm -hmm. And how does that really feel when we stuff down that honest feeling because somebody else told us our pink shirt was really blue? Oh, for sure. I know when things like that have happened in my life, it makes you feel very alone. And also when you're stuffing down those emotions, you repress in emotions. And when you repress emotions, they're building up inside you. They're not, they're not disappearing. They're building up inside you. They're causing stress. Stress itself could cause illness. 70% of illness is caused by stress. And then I think sometimes, you, you know, I've noticed it in myself in my past life, you, you, when you repress emotions and you're, they're too painful to deal with, you tend to, after a while, become numb. And then you know you have those emotions. They pop up, you know, in spurts, but you are, you're clueless on, you just don't know where to go. You just don't know what you're feeling, but you know that something's going on and, and it's a lost feeling. So then you're looking for that comfort. What are you going to do to make these unwanted feelings inside you go away? These spurts, these, these, these confused emotions. How do I really feel about this? You know? You feel alone. You feel like you're in a wrestling match, like a tag team, and, and you have nobody on your side to tag. And the other person has two people on their side, and you're all alone in the corner and trying to do it all yourself. And, and that's a scary feeling. And that's a, a an, and feeling alone is a, is, a, is a really, really tough feeling because to feel that you're alone all by yourself and you have to pick up the weight all by yourself is, is not a good feeling. And it can lead to a lot of neg negative things you know, that occurs and that can occur in your life. Well, 100%. And as you mentioned, you know, stuffing them down, you do become numb. And then you get really good at just one or two emotions. I got really good at being angry or being sad. Right. And then you start denying that you feel anything else. Right. Everything is either angry or sad. Mm -hmm. And if people are really honest with themselves, they struggle to feel happy because they right. don't believe that they deserve to be happy because, right. you know, there's that whole shouldn't thing. Yeah. But the, the biggest problem, when we stuff down our emotions, as you already mentioned, it leads to other things, not just stress. Yeah. How about depression? Oh, for sure. How about self-harming? Yes. How about isolation? 100%. How about thoughts of suicide? 100%. Because when we deny what we really feel, regardless of what it is, then we feel as if there is something wrong with us. Mm -hmm. Instead of acknowledging that our body, our, our insides, our psyche, whatever you want to call it, knows the truth. Right. Right. And I talk about this quite often. There are three people in you. There's me, myself, and I. Me and myself want you to be happy. So they're going to lie to you all day long, all day long. Mm -hmm. I seize the truth. I seize everything. Mm -hmm. And as soon as we acknowledge that I is seeing everything, regardless of what our thoughts are, then we can relax and we can start being really honest with ourselves and let me and myself know that it's okay if we're honest. Right. And where this really was brought into glaring light for me was several years ago, uh, I was really, really angry with some people. I mean, really angry. And 
I was struggling. I write in a notebook every morning, about three pages, and I have written conversations with myself. And this is how I have the conversations about what I'm feeling and what I want to do and all this. And I can talk about that a little bit more. But right now, this particular morning, I was feeling really angry to the point that I had gotten out of bed earlier than normal. And I was writing and I was writing all around my anger. Right. And what I really wanted to be going on. And I finally, and I wrote this, why are you lying to yourself? Mm -hmm. I know what you're thinking. I know what you are feeling. So let's just go ahead and get honest about it. Right. And I took a really deep breath in that moment. And I said, and I wrote, I am so angry. I wish this person would go ahead and die. Mm hmm this is what I wish would happen to these people. This is what I wish would happen. This is how I'm feeling. I can't believe that I have allowed them to occupy so much space in my mind. I am so angry with myself. I am hurt. And I just went on and on and on and on. Right. And when I got to the end, when I was empty, I took a breath and I said, now, doesn't that feel better? Mm-hmm. And I was able to leave the situation right there on those pages, knowing, first of all, there was nothing I could do about the situation. I was not in control. I'm only in control of me. I'm not in control of anyone else. Right. But that was when it really crystallized and solidified for me how important it is that we are honest, regardless of how socially unacceptable something is. Because I, when I, we stuff it down nothing good comes out of that. No, it doesn't. And I, I like how you brought up the, the, the uh, tool of forgiveness where you wrote everything down, because I think sometimes a lot of people actually, they look for the other person to say the words, I'm sorry. They want to hear it from the other person, but that's not the way we heal. It doesn't matter. You know, the, when a person is does something to you or a person hurts you or harms you or maybe vindictive to you. It's not your problem. That's their problem. But they hurt you. But the way that you need to heal, in my opinion, is that don't look for the apology. Look to forgive them, you know, because they are not in their total right mind. They have issues going on, whatever they may be. But if you say, I forgive you because, if you write it down, say, I understand you may have things going on in your life. I understand this and this and this. I'm not sure why you did it, but you know, I still forgive you for your actions because it's not my fault. This is something that's going on in your life, but I forgive you for acting it out and, and putting it towards me. Just write in those words and then just clear in your mind and, and really letting it go, you know, just like maybe a little meditation, maybe, and just letting it go. Think of a dove flying away and just <laughs> let that anger just release, let that, that, that all those emotions that, that, that person did, or, you know, let it release. And I think, you know, that's a, a great healing tool is forgiveness. Like you said, writing it down. Well, and, and the thing about forgiving, and I'm glad that you brought that up so specifically, is forgiveness is not for the other person. Forgiveness is for yourself. Yes. So when we say, you know, we forgive you for whatever the heck it is you've done, please hear this very clearly. You do not need to physically go to contact, get in touch with the other person to forgive them. You can simply stand in the middle of an empty room or an empty field and say, I am forgiving this person for whatever the heck it is they did. Right. Now, the other part of that is, well, I want them to tell me that they're sorry. I want them to do all these things. All right. We are not in control of other people. And I often say to people when they say, well, this is what I want them to do. Okay. If you were to write out a script that covered everything from facial expressions to intonation to body language to everything. You put down all these details in a script and you handed it to the person for them to act out and say, you would be disappointed because you would be thinking to yourself, this is not genuine. They really yes. don't mean it. You'd be second guessing it the whole time. Right. So 
we don't worry about whether the other person is going to apologize, say they're sorry, you know, do any of that kind of stuff. We are not in control of the other person. We are only yes. in control of ourselves. Right. But what I do sometimes is I go back to my notebook, get my pen, and I will write out the conversation as I wished it would happen. Right. And I carry on both sides of the conversation. Mm hmm. And then I close my notebook and I go on about my business. And I even do that with myself. If, if I've done something, made a choice that I really didn't want to make, it wasn't a great choice or whatever, or I'm feeling a little bit disappointed, or even if I'm happy about something. Yes. I have a written conversation back and forth with myself. Well, aren't I am so proud of you for what you did. That is so amazing. Mm -hmm. I can only imagine how you were feeling. Wow, I was feeling so excited. And I do this written conversation back and forth with myself. Yes. Now, people may think that I'm crazy. I really don't care. Yes, I am certifiable. <laughs> I have a certificate to prove it. Mm. But what I discovered when it comes to being honest with ourselves and with our emotions and with owning who we are and what we feel, right? Your feelings are your feelings and nobody else gets a vote. Right. And then the other part of that is how many times do we say so and so made me happy, sad, mad, glad, whatever? Yes. Understand this. No one can make you anything. It's a choice. You can right. choose to be, to feel happy. You can choose to feel sad. You can choose to feel mad. Keep your power. Yes. No one can make you anything, well, except reservations for dinner. And I prefer a five-star restaurant and you pick up the tab. <laughs> uh -huh. I love that. I love that. You know, I... I find in our society too, we have um, a large uh, population that is obese. And a lot of times I will talk to people that have weight problems and it's a lot because they do use food as a source of comfort. And, you know, it's, it's trying to, you know, trying to compensate and not go to food, you know, because it's an addiction you know, becomes a habit, becomes an addiction. You, instead of coping with your emotions, you are running for food, for comfort. And, you know, and, you know, and when you have that behavior, then you, you extend that to other areas of your life. Anytime there's a problem, either it's going to be food, either it's going to be alcohol, either it's going to be drugs. It's going to be something that gives you comfort to an escape, a way of escaping the problem. And I think people have to realize we have to face the problem, no matter how difficult the, the obstacle may be. And even when you deal with your emotions, you know, it's not easy. It's not easy dealing with these emotions. And it can be definitely, it is at some point very painful when you have to face these emotions. But once you get over that hump, I feel like, I feel like it's just, a, it's you see the end of the rainbow right at the end, because it frees you from all these emotions, these negative emotions that have been stirring up with and causing you all these, these things to go on in your body and to make you feel the way you feel. And, and what are some of the suggestions that you feel are good for people to start healing their emotions and not use food for a source of, of love and comfort? Well, the first thing that they can do is as they identify what they are really feeling as they're reaching for whatever they're reaching for, you know, pause, what am I really feeling in this moment? And then listen to what they are really feeling. Right. And then this is what I do. The next thing to say is, well, of course you feel that way. Why wouldn't you? Because don't we all just simply want to be acknowledged? Mm -hmm. And then if you want to do a little bit more work on that, ask yourself, when was the first time I can remember that I felt this way in this situation? What was going on? Who were the players in that event? Right. And oftentimes we can travel back in time to where we are children yeah. and we can see ourselves running into a room, very excited, going up to our parent and very excitedly sharing something with them. And we didn't get the reaction that we were expecting. Instead, you know, we got some offhand comment or, you know, whatever it was. 
And then the next thing we see ourselves doing is looking for comfort somewhere. And oftentimes it's food. Right. Okay. So if we understand that the pattern started way back there, and these are the players, then we can bring ourselves back into the here and now. And we could say, well, of course you feel that way. Why wouldn't you? Yeah. And as, as we acknowledge, as individually, we acknowledge that this is, of course, we feel this way, mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, I'm not having to run and hide who I really and truly am, because that's what we do when we turn to food. We are turning to something so that we can hide who we really are. Yeah. And many times we use um, food to create a larger version of ourselves so that we are protected, insulated. Mm -hmm. And part of my journey that I went on in learning to love myself and literally changing my relationship with food is I was able to shed a hundred pounds and keep it off. That's wonderful. Um, now, do I still struggle? Well, heck yeah. You know, all these many years of all these habits, they don't disappear overnight. Yeah. But I say to people, just start observing when you're reaching into that pantry, when you're really truly not hungry, you're simply right. reaching into it pause, just pause one brief moment and ask what's really going on right now. Yeah. And then listen and then acknowledge, well, of course you feel that way. Why wouldn't right. you? Mm -hmm. I feel like sometimes too, it becomes a habit. We form mm -hmm. these bad habits and we automatically keep repeating them and repeating them. And then it becomes a part of us. Just like when someone gets up in the morning and they have to go get their coffee. Well, do they really need that coffee? Or are they just so used to getting up in the morning and getting that cup of coffee that, you know, it's become a habit, you know? So I think the same thing with food is that even those late night cravings when we're not hungry, but we just feel like the need of putting something in our mouth while we're watching our TV show before we go to bed, you know, it's those bad habits that take control of us. And then- also, we have to go back into our emotions, you know, why are we doing this, you know, you know, and do you, do you like who you see, you know, it's, you know, a lot of people we, we look in the mirror, and we have to ask ourselves, do we like the person we see in the mirror? And if we don't like that person, and there's per that, that person we see that reflection has issues, we really have to address them, I feel like, and, and that's the only way we'll get better. And, you know, I, I like the idea that you mentioned about it could go all the way back to childhood. Most of the time, it does go back to childhood. It is a root cause of why we are the way we are. And if it hasn't been something traumatic along the way, it usually is because of our something that happened in our childhood years. And, and it could be something that, you know, is not, in the big scheme of things significant, mm -hmm. but it was significant in that moment. Yeah. And if we can understand where it began, and I like that you mentioned, you know, we just start a habit. A couple of years ago, I caught myself in this very thing. It was cold here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm in Texas and it doesn't get real cold all that often, but it was cold. And I decided in the evening, I wanted a nice hot cup of decaf coffee. And I wanted to add a little bit of a heavy cream to it, which, right. you know, that's not a big thing to have that once. Yeah. Well, then the next night it was cold again. So I said, you know, I'm going to have a cup of decaf coffee. I'm going to add a little bit of heavy cream to it. And four weeks later, I realized that it wasn't cold anymore, but I was still looking for that cup of decaf coffee with that little bit more of heavy cream. In yeah. It. And I, paused and I said what is going on right why did you develop this habit and what are you going to do about it mm -hmm. and I said I'm really not enjoying it that much because it's not that cold yeah so what I did instead was I observed about what time I was heading for that cup of coffee and this is what I recommend to other people I set an alarm on my phone for about 10, 15 minutes before the usual time I'd been heading for the coffee. Yeah. And I, when the alarm went off, I went and filled my glass up with water, sat back down at the TV and did, you know, went on and did something else. So I interrupted that pattern. Yeah. And that's what I recommend to people. If you were going into this mindless eating because, you know, you find yourself wandering into the pantry at a certain time every night start noting what time it is 
Mm -hmm. set an alarm for about five to 10 minutes before that time. Right. And make a decision ahead of time, make a decision ahead of time. When that alarm goes off, this is what I'm going to do. Right. And after about a month, six weeks, you will have probably interrupted that pattern pretty well where you may not need to set the alarm. Right. But as soon as you find yourself sliding back, set the alarm, do it again. No big deal. I mean, mm -hmm. we set alarms for all kinds of things, right? Right. I like that. I like that a lot. Now, when you see people, when they go up and down, when they have an eating disorder and you, they lose the weight and they get back to normal and then all of a sudden they gain the weight back and it's like an endless cycle. They feel like they've been struggling their whole life and they've been battling food and it, and it just doesn't, they can't win the race. They can't, they doesn't, they doesn't, they, it's like, it's like a, they, they're having such a difficult time getting over the hump. You know, why are these, why is it hard for people? Is it because they haven't really gotten over those unsettled emotions? There's yeah. still things deep down inside that they really need to deep dig, dive deeper into so they can really figure yeah. out the overall problem. Well, to me, it is because the, for me, once I finally was able to lose the weight, keep the weight off, it took the work from the shoulders up. It took getting honest with my emotions, getting honest with my thoughts, my feelings. And as I got honest with those emotions, acknowledged the emotions, allowed them to be instead of stuffing them down. Yeah. Well, then losing the weight was not a battle. When we refuse to do what I call the hard work of the hard work, which is getting honest with our emotions, accepting that these are the feelings that we have, regardless of how acceptable or unacceptable they are, then all we're doing is what I call white knuckling. We're holding on to that steering wheel as tight as we possibly can, trying to drive through that blinding snowstorm on bald tires and you know slick roads and all that kind of stuff yeah and as soon as we hit that icy patch the car is going to spin out of control and then we're going to say to ourselves i'm never going to be able to lose this weight i don't have enough willpower i don't have you know the list is long and lengthy yeah the truth of the matter is it's not willpower it's understanding why you are going for that food and what you are stuffing down Right. Because when we are stuffing down our emotions, it doesn't make any, you know, there's a lot of talk right now about the medications that are out there to help you lose weight. Yeah. Okay. That's all well and good. That's great. Just like, you know, the, the surgeries that happen, that's all well and good. That's great. But you haven't even addressed the reason that you got overweight in the first place. Right. And until you address that reason, it's not going to make any difference what you do or what you don't do. Right. That's, and to rely, funny. you know, to rely heavily on medication or surgery, or anything like that, you're still denying what you're really feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's going to come out sideways. You may not be using food to hurt yourself or to, you know, to stuff the feelings down, but you're going to be doing something. Right. You're going to be doing something. I know for me, um, back before I really started overeating a whole lot, um, I would rip my fingernails because the I preferred the pain of ripping fingernails mm -hmm. over the pain of stuffing down those emotions. Wow. I th I think, you know, like we've talked about um acknowledging the problem, accepting the problem. We talked about journaling, forgiveness, and we, we've we talked about some ways of coping with it, trying to get over the hump, going back to the root cause. Are there any other suggestions? Because if a person is going through this cycle, are there other techniques that we're not discussing yet that really need to be addressed? Well, it depends on what where they are in their journey. But right. to me, to me, if you're just, let's pretend you're just starting out. Mm -hmm. The first thing that I would suggest that you do is look through your house. You're bound to have a notebook somewhere in your house. And I'm not talking about full size, eight and a half by 11 notebook. I don't <laughs> care. You know, small, I, I prefer small ones so that I'm not, you know, overly yeah. challenged with filling the pages, right? But get a notebook, find a color of pen that you like. You know, when you see the writing with that pen, yeah, you smile. Right. 
put those two things next to where you sit in the morning. Mm -hmm. And then when you get up in the morning, start having written conversations with yourself right? about what you're feeling in that moment, what your dreams, wishes, desires are for the day, what went on the day before, what you wish would have happened, what you right. wish might not have happened. Start having those honest conversations and write about three pages right? and commit to doing that for 30 days. Now, if during the day you catch yourself wrestling over something, mm -hmm. go grab that notebook. And the first question that you write down, and yes, I do this. The first question that you write down is what is really going on right now? Right. And then answer in writing what's really going on right now. Right. And then say to yourself in writing, well, of course you feel that way. Right. Why wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. And then let the conversation progress from that point. Right. Now, after you've done that, if the Oreos or the Ruffles or whatever are still calling to you so loudly that you cannot silence them, go and eat the Oreos or the Ruffles or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but acknowledge I'm doing this because this is my choice. Right. I'm choosing to do this because in this moment, this is what I believe I need to calm myself down. Right. But let's be honest. And the other thing is, let's stop labeling ourselves as emotional eaters, stress eaters, overeaters, or whatever. Yeah. Let's simply say, when I... I am struggling with my emotions. My answer to calm myself is to eat. When yeah. I'm struggling with stress, the way I help myself cope with the stress is to eat. Mm -hmm. Let's change how we talk about ourselves. Let's talk about behavior and not define ourselves by these things. Right. And as we change from defining ourselves to focusing on behavior, you'll be able to feel that that burden starts lifting off of you. Right. That makes sense. That makes sense. I like that. Now, if you had to take what we talked about today and you had to like emphasize on some important factors that you think would help the listeners, what things would you like to focus on and emphasize? I would like to emphasize that number one, you are only in control of you. You are not in control of anybody else. That's number one. Number two, no one can make you anything except reservations for dinner. <laughs> I prefer a five-star restaurant and you pick up the tab. So uh -huh. I'll give you my uh -huh. Zelle information and you can send the money to me. Uh -huh. And number three, let's stop doing feelings by committee. Your feelings are your feelings. Nobody else gets a vote. How you feel, regardless of what it is, how unacceptable it is, how acceptable it is, whatever. Yeah. It is your feeling. Your feelings are your feelings. Nobody else gets a vote. Exactly. And fourth, you are enough exactly as you are in this moment. Mm -hmm. And if you don't believe you are enough right now, I will believe it for you until you're able to believe it for yourself. Right. I love that. I love that. You know, I, I think this is very important because so many people struggle with food addiction and so many people are not happy with the person they see and they lie to themselves and they have negative emotions about themselves and they carry a lot of, of weight and baggage on their on their shoulders. And to be able to free yourself from all that and not feel like you have to use food as a comfort is so important. And so if you could if you could get over that addiction, what a, a reward and accomplishment to be able to live life and to deal with your emotions productively so you could have a happy, healthy, and productive life. Now you have some books, some amazing books out there. You have, I think you're on your second book now and uh, 12th. 12th book. That's right. Oh my God. We were talking about this. Yeah. I, I, I have 20 and you said I have 12. I'm like, oh my God, you know, <laughs> I got to get busy. I, we need to hurry up and wrap up so I can go get busy on doing, you know, 
13 through 20. So I'm just, <laughs> just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> so tell us a little about, about your book that you can't eat love and, and tell us a little a premise about the other books that you've written in the past. Well, you can't eat love is the journey that I went on to learn to love myself and, and, uh, change my relationship with food. And I take the reader on the journey that I went on and I call it a journey because that's what we're all on. Right. And yes. one of my main themes that runs through the entire book is a uh, picture, you know, the obstacles that we hit is a traffic jam. Yes. If you are on an, on the road in your vehicle in an actual traffic jam, the last thing that you would do is park your car, get out and walk home. Right. right. But how often when we are you know, on a journey to become the best version of ourselves, we hit a traffic jam. Let's say we go to a friend's birthday party or we don't have a very good day. You know, something happens yeah. and we just throw our hands up in the air and say, you know, I'm a failure. Well, if we look at that as we hit a traffic jam mm -hmm. and in that moment, we suddenly parked our car, got out and walked home. I mean, how ludicrous is that? That's yeah. ridiculous if we see it like that, then we see the insanity of what we're doing. Yeah. Just because we went to a friend's birthday party doesn't mean that we've thrown the whole thing out the window. No, right. it's a traffic jam. What do you do when you're stuck in a traffic jam? You change yeah. the radio, you call a friend. That's a lot of what the, the book is about, you know, helping people um, discover how they can handle the traffic jams. I also talk a lot about triggers, Mm -hmm. Because so many times people talk about avoiding triggers. Yes. Well, Stacy, you know, as well as I do, we can't avoid triggers, but we right. can do is we can plan for triggers. Yes. So I help people come up with plans for the triggers, mm -hmm. come up with plans for those social situations that you know that you're going to be encountering yes. so that you have a plan. And that's what most of the book is about. Then uh, my other books, The Journey from Failing to Healing is the backstory um, to You Can't Eat Love. It takes you through the the dirty, the ugly, the, you know, the awful, the everything of how I learned how to love myself right. and how I discovered that I was never alone, that God had always been there with me. Right. And then um, my sisters and I wrote uh, The Untold Story of Noah's Wife as we made it up. Mm hmm. Uh, the book that I'm working on currently uh, is called What Color Is My Shirt? And the subtitle to that one is Trusting Your Emotions. I like and it's that. because the more that I have talked, the more that I recognize and realize that people don't trust their true emotions. Mm -hmm. And we are sort of doing emotions by committee. And we're yeah. allowing other people to tell us what we should and should not be feeling. So and as a consequence, we're stuffing all this stuff down. Yeah. And as you you've alluded to, and as we've discussed, you know, that leads to self-harm, that leads to overeating, leads to obesity, it leads to health problems, stress, uh, depression, and even thoughts of suicide. Mm -hmm. So it, it my mission for what color is my shirt is to help people understand that even if they are in a land of unhealthy people who try to tell them that their pink shirt is blue, that they can stand in their truth and push back. No, my shirt is blue. Right. I like that. Now, where can people find your books? The easiest way to find anything about me is on my website and including the books is on my website, which is you can't eat love.com. And if you want to reach out and have conversation with me, there's even a place where you can hit, send me a message uh, and it'll email straight to me. And it is really me who answers. I don't have an assistant answering all my emails. I do it myself. And I really do love to hear from people. And do you offer any types of services, any type of coaching? For people? I do. I do work one-on-one -on -one with people. Uh, I work one-on-one -on -one with people um, and we do it virtually. So it's a lot of fun. What, mm -hmm. what you hear right now is pretty much how I work one-on-one -on -one with people, helping them uh, ask, you know, ask themselves questions. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm going to help mm -hmm. you discover what you need to do that works for you. Exactly. Um, I also do some group coaching and then um, ex very exciting. In October, uh, a friend of mine who is a therapist 
and I are doing a retreat for eating disorders um, in the Greek islands. Oh, and nice. you can find out more about that um, on my website as well. And that's happening in October. It's called the Freedom Retreat and the oh, ED. Nice. So it's strictly for eating disorders, eight days, seven nights on a Greek island, everything covered. So well, I'm Greek and I love the Greek islands. It's like 3000 of them. I might just go, I don't have an eating disorder, but I might just go just to be there and to be assistance. Cause I would love to do that. That sounds amazing, but well, it would be so much fun to hang out with you. Yeah. And it's all Mediterranean food, all healthy food down there. So, you know, it's uh, and everything is picked straight from the backyards of these people's homes and, and freshly cooked. So you can't get better than that. Mm -hmm in the sun and the ocean and oh my goodness talk about healing 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 and will you have information on your website about the event? yes yes excellent excellent oh my god leslie this has been amazing i love having you on the show and i hope to see you more often and you know this is an uh, important topic that needs to be really talked about and maybe we can you know go more in depth next time you come and uh, really educate people on how to overcome food addiction because it's something hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people all over the country and globally suffer from. And if we could help just one person, what a difference, right? Amen. Amen on that. Yeah. Just one. That's, that's been my mission to help one person one at a time until mm -hmm. I reach a million people. And then I'm going to start over again. <laughs> I like that. I like that a lot. Well, Leslie, have a great day and thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, Stacy, thank you so much. It's been such a pleasure. You have a great day. You as well.